fear uh, that I think is motivating totalitarians. If a person can ha can acquire an interior sense of freedom because of their belief in the transcendent, in Jimmy's case, his belief in Christ, this this can give hope. Welcome to Acton Line, a podcast from the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. For this episode, we're presenting the final evening plenary from Acton University 2022. This plenary was a panel discussion I moderated on Hong Kong media mogul and pro-democracy advocate Jimmy Lai, the subject of Acton's most recent documentary feature film, The Hong Konger, Jimmy Lai's Extraordinary Struggle for Freedom. When Hong Kong's basic freedoms come under attack, Jimmy Lai finds himself in the crosshairs of the state and must choose between defending Hong Kong's long-standing liberties or his own freedom. This conversation with filmmakers and interview subjects of the Hong Konger discusses the rise of China, the plight of Hong Kong, the fight for freedom that continues there to this day, and the man at the center of it all, Jimmy Lai. The featured panelists are Victoria Tinbor Hui, Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame, Mary Kissel, former Senior Advisor to U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Simon Lee, former op-ed columnist at Jimmy Lai's newspaper Apple Daily, and Father Robert Sirico, President Emeritus here at the Acton Institute and the Executive Producer of The Hong Konger. Jimmy Lai is currently sitting in a jail cell in Hong Kong awaiting trial on national security law charges. Recently, he was granted permission to be represented by a UK barrister in the trial, human rights attorney Tim Owen. That decision to allow Owen to represent Lai is being appealed to Beijing for, quote, clarification. The trial, which was supposed to start on December 1st, has been delayed until December 13th and is almost certain to be delayed even further into the future. To learn more about the film The Hong Konger and Jimmy Lai's fight for freedom, you can visit thehongkongermovie.com. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash podcast. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It is a pleasure again to be with you on this final night of Acton University 2022. Uh, and for this panel on the, our film, The Hong Konger, uh, which I know many of you saw yesterday at one of the two screenings, we're excited to have a great panel here tonight to talk about it. Before we get underway, I do want to tell you that just like the previous evenings, we will be taking questions via Slido. If you go to sli.do or download the app, you can submit questions there and use the code AU2020. 2022, AU 2022, when you submit those questions. And feel free to start submitting them immediately because this is a conversation uh, so we can get right into questions from the very beginning here. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the panel we have this evening um, moving from uh, uh, right to left here. Uh, Victoria Tinbor Hoy is Associate Professor in Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. Simon Lee is a columnist at Apple Daily since 2005, which the newspaper has been forcibly closed down by the Chinese Communist Party in 2021. Um, and actually, uh, someone pointed this out to me this morning. The last issue of Apple Daily uh, came out on June 24th, 2021. Tomorrow is the one year anniversary of that. Mary Kissel is executive vice president and senior policy advisor at Stevens Inc. Prior to that, uh, she served as a senior advisor to U.S. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo. And then finally, a man who really needs no introduction here, Father Robert Sirico is president emeritus and co-founder of the Acton Institute and executive producer of The Hong Konger. So Father, I, I want to start with you with a very simple and obvious question. Why did you want to make this film? To be honest with you, it's personal for me. Jimmy is a friend, as a man I've known for 
the better part of 25 years. I know the man. And the other reality is that I detest communism. And when I saw this conflict, and I knew our own capacity, just what we have done, the networks we have, I felt it was important that we, um, we bring this story to the fore and personalize it. As I say in the film, this is not just about Jimmy Lai, this is not just about Hong Kong, this is about humanity. And, and what Jimmy's experiencing really brings to the fore a perennial struggle in human history between force and freedom. And that's why I thought it was important that this film be produced. No, I do want this to be a conversation, so everybody else up here, don't feel free to, or feel free to, to jump in when, whenever that you would like. Um, Simon, I know you worked with Jimmy um, at Apple Daily. Yeah, tell me about your experience with the man, your experience at Apple Daily. Um, he is first and foremost an entrepreneur. And as an entrepreneur, Jimmy has his own quirkiness. Um, you have to work really close with him to know that. But having said that, he, this is the hope tonight, which I try to reflect on, was Jimmy is always a few steps ahead of other people. When I worked with him, he had this crazy idea, which don't turn into reality after maybe a decade or so. So when Jimmy, I, I always keep thinking like, what Jimmy would do now if he tells me. I think what he is doing, I see it as one of his you know, usual behavior is just a few steps ahead. I hope that's the, the, the takeaway I have from the documentary. Victoria, can you talk to us about <clears throat> What is happening right now in Hong Kong? What is the state of affairs uh, in the city? Uh, tell us what we know about what has been happening since, you know, we, we documented in the film, for those who saw it, the handover in the late 90s, uh, how quickly the CCP begins to back away from the agreement. Um, what is it like right now in that city for the people who reside there? This is important, but let me just really thank the Eton Institute for making this film. There are a lot of um, documentaries about the Hong Kong protest. A lot of them uh, usually are seen by other fellow Hong Kongers. And in order to really keep Hong Kong in the spotlight, uh, I've heard from other Hong Kongers that this particular film basically manages to speak to ordinary Americans and the rest of the world much better than anything else. So I really want to thank the Eton Institute for that. <laughs> and then back to the question, what is going on in, China, in Hong Kong now after you, know, you, you, you finish filming the, in Jimmy Lai? So Jimmy has been in jail, and given that, and it, it, the t as of now, he is uh, under national security charges for collusion with foreign forces. And f he is already serving sentences for quote unquote unlawful assembly under multiple charges. And what does it mean to have, a, you know, to be a convicted of unlawful assembly? In Hong Kong to protest, you have to apply for a no objection permit from the police. The police can render any protest unlawful by refusing to issue that uh, no objection permit. And to, basically, in, by August 2019, the police began to refuse to issue such permit. When tr traditionally, historically, the police would just basically take that as a kind of like a performer a routine. You know, essentially, anyone who files for 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 the permits, they would get it. And as such, then so many people have been locked up just for that. And also that traditionally, if people were convicted of unlawful assembly, at the most, they would be given community sentences. And now people are given eight months, 10 months, 15 months uh, of jail time just for attending or organizing an unlawful assembly. And Jimmy is arrested for also uh, under the national security law. And he had he's denied bail for that. And 
and, and along with other people who've been charged under the national security law, many of these people have been denied bail. The significance of this is that this essentially turns around the whole common law doctrine that people should be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Mm. What the national security law and the, and the routine denial of bail means that you are proven guilty unless you can prove yourself innocent. And that's already true with a lot of the other um, uh, trial, uh, court cases, even for rioting charges, people would have to prove that either they were not there or they were, they were on site because they actually had a good reason that they were literally walking past, or they would have to basically uh, file calls on social media that, you know, can you guys, can anyone provide any video of what happened at this particular moment in this particular location to prove that I'm innocent. That's already true across all of the protest cases with the national security law. It's even a basically conviction is almost guaranteed. And we also have John Lee, who is going to swear in as the next chief executive. And John Lee was responsible for introducing the, intra, the extradition law that prov provoked the protests in 2019. He was also in charge of the bloody protests, uh, the bloody crackdown by the police. And now he's handpicked as the next chief executive. So things are just going to get worse. Mary, you worked with Secretary Pompeo um, when a lot of this was transpiring. Um, talk to us about the, what were the conversations like as we're watching what is happening in Hong Kong and what is your assessment of uh, where we're at now and what uh, China is thinking after more or less successfully imposing their will on Hong Kong, a lot of people worry Taiwan is next. Um, what, talk to us about that. Well, I, I also wanted to thank the Acton Institute and for, for all of you for being here and for um, having such an interest in the Hong Konger and in Jimmy's story. Uh, it's quite an important story. And so before I answer your question, I just want to pick up on what Simon and Victoria and father have, have said because it's a, it's a personal thing for, for all of us because we all know Jimmy very, very well. Um, and Simon said something. He said, um, I always feel like Jimmy's a bit uh, ahead of us. Yeah. And I agree, he is. And to explain why, you have to appreciate um, what it would feel like to have the kinds of freedoms that all of us enjoy here, and then suddenly have them taken away. Because in Hong Kong, not so long ago, you could go to mass, and you could express yourself, and you could go to Victoria Park, and you could protest, and it wasn't a problem. But imagine having that wrenched away from you, whereas in mainland China, you have generations that have just been oppressed by the communists, and they don't know anything different. They've never experienced unalienable rights, but the Hong Kongers had them. And so I think Jimmy said something, actually, in an interview that um, I had connected him with. He, he went on national television in the United States, and he said, this matters to you because we're the first battle. We may be halfway around the world, but it's coming to you next. And that, to me, was the import. And when you said, Victoria, that it spoke to Hong Kongers, I think they naturally understand. I, I don't know if you do you agree with this, that they naturally understand that they are the first fight. Um, and they're actually, it's not the Cold War. They're actually inside our gates. They're within our country. They're harassing wonderful Chinese uh, immigrants, dissidents, Chinese Americans. Um, they're here. And they've integrated and they've bought off Wall Street, Hollywood, and Silicon Valley. So this is a very different challenge. Now, you asked me about what it was like inside the State Department. We had an unusual, some would say, gift from God insofar as there were a small group of us who had all lived and worked in China and Hong Kong uh, at the different agencies. And we all just happened to come into government at the same time. So um, last thing I'll say, when I saw the Fugitive Ordinance Act come into power, I knew Jimmy had to meet the secretary because I had to make it personal for the secretary. So I called up and I made sure that Jimmy came in and they said, who do you want in the meeting? I said, I don't want anybody in the meeting. He should sit with Secretary Pompeo and they should talk as two human beings and they should get to know one another. And it became a very personal thing for the secretary as well. Not just because of Jimmy, but because of the 8 million Hong Kongers um, who have shown extraordinary courage. And Jimmy in that sense is kind of an everyman in this documentary because the Hong Kong people are just, as you can see, extraordinary people. Yeah.
You know, what Simon said of, you know, GB being ahead of us, one of the things that struck me in the film is, you know, and, and the advantage that I think Acton had in making this film is that we'd interviewed him numerous times. And one of the things that has always struck me is the, to my knowledge, the first time that we had interviewed him was for The Call of the Entrepreneur. And he says in there, when he talks about the handover of Hong Kong to China, that you know, some people are saying, you know, I might be arrested, I might be arrested. You see, even that far back, he had a sense of what might be coming. Um, and one of the things we want to highlight in the film as well is how his, his faith has, has sustained him. Um, Father, I hope you could talk about that, that you know, this is, this is a man knowing what his burden would be and willingly taking up his cross. And for me, now that I've gotten to, to travel with this film and show it to audiences, and one of the lines that always affects me the most, even as many times as I've watched it, is Lord Patton, when he says that, you know, that Jimmy has been incredibly brave. And in his voice, you hear when he says, and I'd like to think that I would have been as brave. That same kind of questioning that is always in my mind. Would I be that brave in those circumstances? And I think from what I've learned about Jimmy, it's how much his faith sustains him in that. Yeah, I think that's very true. I mean, some of the early clips uh, in the film where he, he talks about that, they were filmed at his home in Hong Kong. Chris and I visited there numerous times over the years, and uh, that particular time, um, he spoke about the possibility of his being arrested and his knowledge of, uh, of what he had to do. Um, when we pulled in, uh, back then, we had a camera crew with us and everything was wonderful. Must have been to Hong Kong probably five or six times since that filming mm -hmm. over the years. And the last time we visited Jimmy, I think it was in, probably in 2018, when we drove up, um, Jimmy sent a car. He said, we'll send a car. You don't take a taxi. Just And so we got in the car and... I was answering emails, uh, I had my head down, and as we pulled in to the street that leads up to his house, uh, all of a sudden there were all these lights going on and off and on and off, and I, I looked up and I said, what is this? And Chris said, it's the paparazzi. And it was these um, communist employed photographers and writers and journalists, uh, they were really journalists. Apparatchiks. Uh, apparatchiks. And so we pulled in and Jimmy greeted us. We had a wonderful dinner that night with Cardinal Zen, who also was arrested and then released, who has been an indefatigable uh, uh, defender of, of human rights in China, uh, of Jimmy, a friend of Jimmy, uh, went to the Vatican and was not received an audience with the Pope. A Pope not receiving a cardinal who went to talk to him about China. It's inconceivable to me. He didn't receive us either. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Same year. Pelosi got to see him, though. But I, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> Mea maxima culpa. Well, maybe not maxima. Uh, anyway, um, when we were done with... Uh, uh, done with dinner. You remember Audrey Dillathorne? Sure. She was at that dinner that night. There's a wonderful woman who got us into China to visit to Shanghai and, and um, we went up to uh, Sichuan and met the archbishop there and there are photos of us meeting with him and I, I slipped him a thousand dollars. I said to him, when, when we met him they said there has to be an interpreter in the room, a representative of the Communist Party. And uh, Audrey arranged all of this. And um, I said, I said, Your Excellency, uh, when I met him, they uh, said, well, this representative of the Communist Party has to be in the room. And I said, but I, I want to have a private conversation. They said, well, you can have a private conversation. She doesn't speak English. I said, but the Archbishop doesn't speak uh, English either. Uh, I said, so it's going to have to be translated. And they said, well, that's the way it's going to go. So the minute I met him, I said to him, Eccellenza è un gran piacere di conoscerla, in Italian. Your Excellency, it's a great honor to know you. And he looked at me, he said, 
anche per me è un gran piacere. <laughs> also for me it's a great honor. And so we sat and talked in Italian. <laughs> so we flew to the commies. And then I slipped him a thousand dollars in a book written by George Weigel, <laughs> you know, and who's who's also in the film. But uh, the, when when we left uh, that dinner that night with Cardinal Zen and Audrey Dillathorne and and uh, Jimmy's wife and uh, the paparazzi were there and followed us all the way back to the hotel. Now I'm a boy from Brooklyn. You provoke me. I provoke you. <laughs> so we got out of the car. The chauffeur opened the door for us, and the, the, the doormen were there. And I said, excuse me, Chris, I got to go uh, talk to these guys. And they all pulled up, were taking pictures, thinking they were going to intimidate us. And I walked right into the midst of them. I said, did you want to know who I am? You want to know who I am? Who are you? And I said, let's talk. Of course, none of them could speak English. They were all probably from mainland China. I don't know. You, Simon, you would know better than I uh, what, who these people were. They ran away. When you confront a bully, they, they run. And that's what Jimmy's doing right now, at this moment. Did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Victoria, I think you wanted to jump I in. just want to add that um, now that Cardinal Zen is also arrested, he's released on bail, but then he's charged for collusion with foreign forces as well because he's one of the trustees of the June 12 Humanitarian Relief Fund. What the fund they used to do was to provide assist legal, psychological, and whatever assistance to people who were arrested. And why it is named uh, June 12? It's because June 12 was the day. So on June 9th, a million people protested, and the government ignored the protest. And they said that we're going to continue to, to debate the bill and have a second reading of the bill. Once you have the second reading, and then the third reading basically follows. So the bill would have been passed. Uh, tens of thousands of people surrounded the Legislative Council building, and that prevented LegCo from even convening at all that day. And then uh, on, and several days later, the chief executive, Carrie Lam, said that we're going to suspend the bill. And then on June 16, 2 million people protested. So uh, also on June 12, that was the first time that the government characterized the protests as a riot mm. and began to charge people with rioting. And rioting would get you 10 years in jail. And so Cardinal Sen, along with very prominent Hong Kong people, including one of the very veteran uh, barrister, uh, uh, Margaret, and they formed this fund, and people pour in donations. And what is happening now, why, the, why they actually arrested, in a way, because the government does not want any assistance to the arrested. They have this massive arrest, and they want to make sure that the arrested do not even get sufficient uh, protection, denying them of any, any, any uh, due process of law and any kind of assistance also being cut off. There's a lot of details I don't want to get into. But one thing is important is that for so long, people were thinking that Cardinal Sen, with his moral stature, his international stature, should be untouchable. And if Cardinal Sen can be touched, who else is safe in Hong Kong today? So that is a very difficult situation that we are in. I'm going to start throwing out some of the questions that are coming in from, uh, from the audience. And whoever wants to jump in on them, please feel free to do so. Before but you do that, Eric, yes, of course. one of the things I want to underscore is the um, broad nature of this issue. This is not just a conservative versus communist issue. It may sound that way, when, especially when I talk about it. But the, the, the people that were arrested represented a broad spectrum of people, especially these last four. Because what you didn't mention, or if you did, you went too quick for me, uh, was Denise Ho, mm -hmm. who is a, 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 would you call her a rock star, a singer, who is a lesbian. And the gay community in Hong Kong also has been speaking out in union with the Cardinal, in union with Jimmy Lai, in union with Martin Lee and others who represent a broad spectrum of people. When this happens, when you have this kind of broad spectrum, I mean, the major, uh, uh, what, what, the, what are the percentage of people who came out to protest in those marches? There's a significant percentage of the island of Hong Kong. And this is what 
the Chinese government, the mainland government, is afraid of. The diversity of this protest because people see the commonality of this cause. If I would just quickly add to that is the crackdown, the national security law was designed to quickly quell the protest. They said that they needed a law in order to stop uh, all of those people who turned violent during the, the protest. What happened actually was that there was this uh, direct elections to the district councils and the pro-democracy candidates won in a landslide and that happened on November 24th, 2019. And essentially, the movement had turned to non peaceful, nonviolent means of organizing. And all kinds of prof professions, they were organizing the unions. Over 4,000 un new unions were registered between the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. It's actually this kind of all people participation. This is why today that we see the crackdown being so harsh. They arrest not just you know the, the protesters, but also the, why all of these civil society organizations are also being forced to shut down. Essentially, this is a campaign to completely kill the civil society. And there's an antecedent to that too, which is the Tiananmen protests, which by the way were national protests. They didn't just happen in Beijing. But the untold story of Tiananmen in 1989, all you hear about are the students in the square, but in actuality, it was one of whom we have here with us tonight. But yes, one of whom we have here tonight. Thank you for being here. Defense young, yes, sir, please. Yes. But the students in the square were protected. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. They were protected by the people of Beijing who streamed out into the streets around the square. And a lot of the carnage happened and was visited upon those ordinary Beijingers. So the reason that the Communist Party is so afraid of Hong Kongers and this unity that Victoria and Father are speaking about is because they saw the power of it way back in 1989. Let's get to some of the questions from, from the audience. Uh, what do we know, how, how is Jimmy's family doing, and what do we know about how he's doing personally right now? Do we know? Um, beginning of this year, in the first few months, um, I was told uh, the government actually used COVID as an excuse to deny all the visits, not only to Jimmy, but um, we are talking about there are 1,000, at least 1,000 people prisoned in Hong Kong because of the protests since 2019. So um, Jimmy included was uh, denying the visit. So for a long time, there's no way uh, the outside world can get into touch with him. Another thing I was told is uh, Jimmy is um, in solitary confinement. And um, it has been for a long time and it is way beyond any reasonable treatment for him. I do know this. I, I do know uh, two, two things. Uh, first is that prior to this COVID uh, crackdown, that um, Teresa was able to visit him. A uh, request came to me through common friends who were in touch with him uh, for a list of books that he should be reading. Uh, and I know that he asked others for this too. I know he asked Cardinal Zen for this. And my recommendations was, um, were um, Thomas More, Cardinal Francis Xavier Nguyen Van Tuan, who spent 13 years, nine of them in co solitary confinement, under the Vietnamese communists, who, by the way, is up for canonization now. He, he since died, a friend of the Acton Institute. And Cardinal Pell, another friend of the Acton Institute, who spent uh, uh, more than a year in prison as a result of false accusations. He was eventually vindicated by the Supreme Court of Australia. So I recommended these books, uh, and uh, this is the fear uh, that I think is motivating totalitarians. If a person can, ha can acquire 
an, in, an interior sense of freedom because of their belief in the transcendent. In Jimmy's case, his belief in Christ, because he, he converted to Christianity uh, as a result of Teresa's um, uh, wonderful, gentle witness. Uh, this, this can give hope. So uh, I think this is going on. And the other thing I know is that at least he knows this film has been produced. The family has seen the early drafts of this film and they have communicated that to Jimmy. So he feels your presence. I can add to that is it is very important um, for political prisoners to know that other people still think about them so that they do not languish in jail. So it is very important that you know we keep Hong Kong on the agenda and so also let them know that you know the rest of the world still care about them. Um, otherwise all the efforts would have been in vain. Yes. Mm. Lord Patton in the film uh, at one point talks about how the police force, which had been a good police force, behaved outrageously in the course of some of the protests. One of the questions here from the audience, why were the police willing to enforce these laws? Are they not Hong Kongers themselves? I can try to, to uh, tackle this. And the thing is that early on, there was a lot of suspicion that those uh, brutal police officers were mainlanders. So people were trying to film them. You know, maybe some of these people, they don't talk at all. Uh, maybe they cannot speak Cantonese. Or when they speak Cantonese, they use terms that are un unfamiliar to Hong Kong people, but more like, you know, what people would use in Guangdong. But then later on, it became very obvious that these are Hong Kong police officers. I also can testify to when I was a little girl, um, my mom would take us, I, we have three, um, uh, uh, my mom has three kids and so she has only two hands and she, every time she took us out she would say that, you know, I cannot hold all of your hands. If one of you get lost, don't trust any two strangers, but go ask help from a police auntie or a police uncle. That was the kind of trust that we had. And through the years when we protested on January 1st, June 4th, Ju July 1st, October 1st, you would see these police officers will say high five to them and they were all friendly. They would basically, you know, just help protesters. So the transformation was very, very stark. But then in hindsight, it became very obvious that over the years that the liaison office uh, Be Be Beijing's influence in, with the police force actually had been very, very profound. Why John Lee is picked as the next chief executive? He was personally groomed. And he visited Xinjiang and, said, and praised the quote unquote counter terror campaign in Xinjiang. So, and at the same time, they also have these huge social funds that essentially, you know, they enjoy tons of perks. I have to say, it is just so sad to admit that people can be bought. And when, and at the same time, you know, when people are encouraged that, you know, if you beat people up, you can act beast like, and there'll be no consequences. And there's no restraint. People would act like beast. So both the incentives, um, the incentive structure as well as just, you know, no consequences. Um, I have something to add. I remember, um, because I was, other than a columnist and working at Apple Daily, sometimes I go onto the street. Um, so I remember before 2014, like 2010, 2008, to begin with, there were not too many protests on the street at that time, maybe once or twice every year. And the police were friendly. The police were like, okay, it's about time, yeah, let's go home, I, you know. It's too hot today, that kind of thing. So, all the way up till 2014, that was the first umbrella revolution. Then I saw um, a few things, including what Victoria described. Um, there are more political education and involvement in police force. And at the same time, I witnessed like, firsthand mm. the escalation of uh, conflict between people and police and police I have friends who used to be friends um, becoming more hostile and distant from us. So um, it is not a mere political influence, but I think it's more a cultural influence from a small group, let's say the police, 
and then to the more militant people of Hong Kong, and then guess what? Um, I think if the documentary gives me another message, that is, Hong Kong is a place, but we didn't talk about the place at all. You don't even see a map showing, oh, this is Hong Kong. In the, in, I think in the 60s, 70s, you have to tell people where Hong Kong is. And, but then we don't even see a map at all. Because during the production, I talked to the director and I uh, suggested him talk, uh, look at the geographical things, like when the protests move on, we talked about those things. But it turns out the, the documentary is about, firstly, the people, the Hong Kong Kong-er. But secondly, once you have a place and a people, then Hong Kong is no longer just the place and the people. Hong Kong is an idea. Mm. If there's one thing that's under threat here, Hong Kong was just the first one. Geographically closest to China and in many ways socially, economically more associated. But Hong Kong is the first place that the idea is crushed in front of us. And this is the documentary about that. Mm. Can I just add a little? Yeah, bit? absolutely. Then I have a um, question for you, Mary. Just a kind of a, a personal comment about Jimmy, um, which ties into what you've both said. Um, was Victoria? You said you know it's just so disheartening to see that people can be bought, and the tragedy about Hong Kong is that it was Hong Kongers oppressing other Hong Kongers, and it wasn't just the police. It's the chief executive. It's the civil service. It was all of the people who were bought by Beijing, and particularly the CEOs and the corporate leaders. And that's an important lesson for us here, too, because they, too, can be bought, and some of them have been bought here. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Jimmy always knew that that wasn't for him, and he shunned their company. He didn't spend time with them. He didn't go to the fancy dinners and the galas and the balls. He wanted to come home to his family because he saw that corruption and he saw where it was going to lead. And I think that was something else where he saw so far ahead, Simon. He, yeah. he saw so far ahead. Yeah, it, it, for me, really drives it home as well as we see, see the conversation at the end of the film where Mark Simon points out that, you know, Wall Street is not helping. We certainly see um, the NBA, Hollywood, the people who have money interests in China not helping. And then you have that contrast with this man who was a billionaire, right. who could have left at any time, right. and so willing to give that up for what he believed in for his principles. Right. Um, Mary, if you, maybe you take this as well. The uh, question from the audience, is there anything happening at a diplomatic level right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hong Kong? Is, is the US or the UK taking any responsibility for this, any support, or are nations just kind of standing by and waiting for disaster to happen? Well, the UK has a special responsibility to Hong Kong as a former colonial power, and they have taken in tens of thousands of Hong Kongers who possessed a certain passport and that's wonderful. When the protests began, we had many discussions internally about what we could physically do. And there wasn't much we could physically do, aside from severing normal ties with Hong Kong. But uh, I had an idea, which was to use Hong Kong as a way to teach the world and to teach America about the nature of the regime and their inability and unwillingness to live up to any commitment or promise they had made because they promised the Hong Kong people and the United Nations that Hong Kong would enjoy 50 years of freedom. And they broke that promise to the Hong Kong people, but they also broke it to the world. And so we started to talk, we called it the Broken Promises Campaign, and we started this to explain it's not just in Hong Kong where they've broken their promise. They've broken their promise everywhere they've gone. How can you ever trust them? You can't. And so Hong Kong, again, took on a greater significance, and more people started to say this, and you hear it even today. This administration, uh, to their great credit, has maintained many of the policies, even the rhetoric uh, that we use, not all, um, but it's not a partisan issue and it shouldn't be. 
because the fight for freedom and the fight to preserve our own freedoms and our own national security are not partisan issues. And they haven't been made so, and I think that that's a great triumph and it's a good first step uh, on our road to figuring out how we confront a very vicious enemy like the one that, that we're confronting today. If I may add, the, um, the House passed the America Can Peace Act with provisions to help Hong Kongers and Uyghurs. We're talking about, you know, giving professionals about basically 5,000 uh, cases for five years, every year for five years. And that's um, because of that bill is different from what the Senate passed. And in this um, kind of conferencing, i trying to iron out the differences. There's very little support. And so if you think that, you know, it is what, because essentially there's nothing we could do to really, you know, restore Hong Kong. The only way is to help those who want to and can leave Hong Kong. So maybe if you have a vote, just write to your, your senator, your, mem your, your member uh, representative that, you know, you support provisions to help Hong Kongers and Uyghurs. Father, uh, would you talk about the church in China? We had a question. The number of Christians in China is uh, growing and quite literally countless. Uh, what do you think will be the political impact uh, from the growing church in China? Mm. Talk to us about that. Yes, yeah, so when, when we talk about the church in China, we need to make very clear, or, or religion in China, even more generally, the church that I'm familiar with is the Christian church. The um, evangelicals, uh, I, I remember in Shanghai when we visited that time, the last time we went to a bookstore in Shanghai. It was a, just a little Christian bookstore, and they had books by Bonhoeffer on the shelf and Calvin and all these different, and, and Catholic writers, and it was just a, a mix of different things. And I, I remember we were negotiating the sale of uh, or the publication of our own books in China. I was amazed to see the diversity of literature that was there. The one thing the Chinese government insisted on, this is back in uh, 2018, was that Bibles be published by the Communist Party and sold by the Communist Party. Well, I thought to myself, well, uh, at least they're publishing Bibles. Well, in this little bookstore, I came upon this little Bible. There were some Bibles on the shelf, and I said to the proprietor, I said, um, this is the Bible. There was an English Bible, there were Chinese Bibles, King James Bible, and there were some other Chinese translations. He said, yes, yes, it's the Bible. I said, but you're not allowed to sell this. He said, no, 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 we're not allowed to sell this. I said, can I buy this? He said, yes, you can buy this. <laughs> and it gave me an insight into, and you would understand this better than I, it gave me an insight into this way of thinking in China. No, this is the official thing. No, we can't do this. Do you want to? Yeah, we can do this. <laughs> and we talked with them about the, uh, the underground church, both the evangelical and the Catholic church in China, and uh, the fact that there was this robust thing and robust movement and that there were missionaries coming into China on business visas or visas to, to teach English as a second language. And it was this bifurcation again. People kind of knew. When, when I went into China the first time, I didn't wear clerical garments. I, I just wore a suit and walked in with a, by the way, a big suitcase filled with catechisms, rosary beads, uh, books on free markets and stuff like that, uh, which they never touched. Uh, and then immediately later that night, I was interviewed in a Roman collar on Chinese TV. This again is much before 2018. So it's all this kind of two ways of thinking, which is difficult for Westerners to conceive. Uh, but the reality was, that the vibrant church that was growing, both in the evangelical and in the Catholic sector, was underground, informal, and constantly under, at any moment, could be uh, suppressed. We went to the church in, in um, I, I suppose it was Shanghai, 
uh, the, the Catholic Church. And after the Mass, the priest came up to me. I didn't come celebrate the Mass with him because we don't have communion. The Roman Church didn't have communion with the, the established church in China. And the priest came up and said, well, why didn't you come celebrate the Mass? I said, because you're not in communion with the Pope. And he just kind of looked at me. <laughs> and he said, well, you can. I said, no, I can't. But then we went to visit Archbishop Juan and celebrated Mass in the little chapel there. And uh, the church is vibrant in China, and they are nervous about it. And there's a similar situation with the Uyghurs. You know, my friends, most of us are, are Christians in this room. We have to be very respectful of the Uyghurs and the Falun Gong, which is a, a religion I don't understand. But when you arrest people because they stand in front of buildings quietly and look at the building, there's something wrong with you, not with them. You know, I, I, I don't know their theology or anything about it. Same thing with the Uyghurs. Uh, I, I know there's lots of tension among Christians uh, in the United States, especially evangelicals and some Catholics with Muslims. I get that. We have Muslims here. We need to develop ways of talking with one another. But what we don't need to do is think so much about it that we don't immediately say that what is going on with the Uyghurs is an imitation of Nazi Germany. We need to raise our voices against that. Uh, and, and we don't have to drop our doctrinal purity in order to achieve that. So uh, there's a great tension and there's a great potential with religion in general in China, not just the church. If you're asking me, if that question is asking me about the Vatican, I am discouraged and I deplore the current uh, diplomacy of the Vatican with regard to China. I, I understand that there are debates going on in the Holy See with the best prudential approach to this thing, but we should have learned our lesson uh, under the Nazis and, and the way in which we need to, do, our, our business is not politics. Our business is human dignity and human life and the truth. And we need to stand up for that. Well, we have a- And I'll never be a Monsignor now. <laughs> <laughs> We have a few minutes remaining. I want to get to two more questions. So anybody, feel free to jump in on this. But again, just a couple minutes left. Uh, why do you think everyone is so enthusiastically upset about Ukraine, but not about Hong Kong? Hmm. Um, I can try that. Uh, I don't think that is true. Because I would say that when we saw the repression in Tibet, the rest of the world knew about it and looked the other way. When news first emerged that there were education camps, quote unquote education camps in, in Xinjiang, people f first, the first reaction was that it had to be fake news, not possible, you know, in the 21st century. When the evidence became undeniable, people looked the other way. And it was really, and then also over the years, both the UK Foreign Office and the US Department of State actually repeatedly we say in the report, one country, two systems, you know, there are a lot of these problems, including disqualification of elected legislators, including the abduction of uh, booksellers from Hong Kong. But on the whole, one country, two systems is still okay. But with the protests in 2019, with the extent of police brutality, people could not look the other way. And because of Hong Kong, then people also began to pay attention to what happened in Xinjiang, what happened in, in Tibet. And also that the, say, the saying became very prominent, today's Hong Kong, tomorrow's Taiwan. So I would say what happens in Ukraine is that because it is a much worse situation, and because people actually are kill and, and this is an actual invasion. So there's basically a lot more resources, a lot more support, and also because Ukraine is a country and therefore it is possible actually to send them military assistance, send them military weapons. And Hong Kong, you know, technically is a piece of Chinese territory. And so there's very little that the rest of the world could do. So I would say the kind of attention, the amount of attention is the same. It's the kind of assistance that is very different. But I think what is more important is to pay attention to Taiwan. Um, may I add yes. a little? Um, well, to be honest, 
Firstly, um, just now during dinner, I talked to um, Taras sitting next to me. He's from Ukraine. And I told him, Ukraine, the fight since 2014 has been, uh, not 2014, actually way beyond that, but has been an inspiration to Hong Kong people. Mm. So not unrelated. And as someone who works in the news business, I can tell you, it is not a problem with Ukraine or Hong Kong. It's a problem with human nature called attention, and that is normal. And that is why we have to keep uh, the message across and help people to remember what happened. Let's close with this question, and uh, all of you feel free to add something to it. Uh, other than, of course, hosting screenings of the Hong Konger, uh, if you have an audience or even just family or friends who'd like to see it, we've talked about the Vatican, we've talked about governments, we've talked about institutions. What can individuals do to support the people of Hong Kong? Um, let me just repeat that if you have a vote in the U.S., make sure that you write to your senator, your, your representative, that you support provisions for Hong Kongers and Uyghurs. And that is important. At the same time, talk to, you know, share this film with other people so that because um, in a way that so many Americans actually don't know what, to, you know, they kind of have some sense that, you know, Hong Kong is, you know, doing really something very awful things have happened to Hong Kong, but they don't know the exact details. So if you kind of have watched this film, promote it with other people. I also want to add one point to what um, Father just said. They, I've been talking to religious leaders from out of Hong Kong as well. This, this, they worry that Hong Kong's churches, both Protestant and Catholic, are going to become like patriotic churches in, in China. Mm -hmm. And it's already moving in that direction. And it won't take very long that they'll completely be co-opted. So that's the sad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I always think about this question, and for the time being, I think we have to realize that it is not only Jimmy and the 1,000 political prisoners I talked about, and the bigger population of 7 million or so, or even 1.4 billion people in China. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you look at all other places, and try to reduce to the one single point of failure. That is the idea which China is trying to spread around the world. Look at COVID. China effectively exported not only the virus, but the way of running society. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. luckily, I think we recovered while well, China is still doing the COVID zero, good for them. <laughs> but we are actually recovering, and now it is time for us to have the immunity. Mm -hmm. But to have immunity, you have to acknowledge the nature of the disease. And for more than 40 years, we never acknowledged that China was a communist regime or a totalitarian regime. And now we've woken up. We know what it is. So the most important thing is that we talk about what it actually is, the reality. We don't call him President Xi. We call him General Secretary. We don't call it the People's Republic of China. We call it Communist China, because that's what it is. You show the film, you elect people who tell the truth and are courageous enough to tell the truth. You support Hong Kongers, Chinese who come here, Chinese American community that's afraid to speak out. You support Chinese students on college campuses who want to learn about things like Tiananmen and what happened in Hong Kong, but they're too afraid to sign up for the courses because they'll be tailed. You need to talk to your university administrators about that. You need to talk to your priests about it. Why hasn't the Pope? come out more forcefully, I can say this. Me for too. <laughs> for the Cardinal and for the Catholics, not just about of Hong Kong, but all of, most of the democracy leaders in Hong Kong are Catholics. Where's the Vatican? Show the film, talk to your neighbors, 
support the wonderful relationship that we have had with the Chinese people and the Hong Kong people. Do it all the time. Never forget. Keep pressing on. Please join me, join me in thanking Victoria, Simon, Mary, Father Robert. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Actin Line, I'm Eric Combs.